Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's episode is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. Adam Grant is the youngest tenured professor at Wharton and an expert on how to make workplaces more collaborative, creative, and productive. As one of the world's most influential management thinkers, Adam has worked with clients like Google, the NBA, the U.S. Army and Navy, and Disney Pixar as a speaker and consultant. His TED Talks have been viewed more than 16 million times, and he's the co-author of three New York Times bestselling books, Give and Take, Originals, and Option B, which he co-wrote with Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg. Today, we talk about how to find motivation and meaning at work, why giving drives success, and how we can build resilience and rediscover joy after setbacks. There are so many great takeaways, so let's get right into it. Here's my conversation with Adam Grant. All right, so Adam Grant, what a treat to have you on. Wow, as I said before we went live, you're you're the first Michigan grad I've been begging to talk to in a long time. (laughs) Go Blue. That's right. (laughs) That's right. You know, as an organizational psychologist, how do you go about putting hard data to things that seem so hard to measure, like generosity and creativity and resiliency? Well, I think I think just because something is hard to measure doesn't mean we can't get better at measuring it. And so uh, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. When, when I started studying giving and taking and matching uh, as different styles of interaction and was really curious to figure out, okay, how do we know if you're more of a giver or a taker or you, know, you just like to kind of match other people's favors evenly? Um, I just started with simple surveys and and had people report what their preferences were. And lo and behold, you get a really nice bell curve where most people say, hey, you know, I think the right way to to navigate a relationship uh, is to trade favors equally. And that's fair. And that way I'm not too selfish or too generous. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have a subset of people who will say, no, you know, if you don't put yourself first, no one else will. And, you know, I, I believe I have to be a taker because that's kind of how the world is organized. And, you know, then an opposite group of people says, no, actually, I enjoy helping others with no strings attached. And I actually like to be somebody who gives more than I get. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, you know, you start to see those those differences and then begin, I, I started then tracking, you know, okay, can we pr- predict people's sales revenue? Uh, can we predict engineers' productivity? And then, you know, you start to get a little more sophisticated and say, all right, let me, uh, let me now have people rate one another and see if your coworkers agree Mm -hmm. on where you stand on those traits. And then, you know, you start to see some consensus there. Uh, Not perfect, of course, but you can triangulate. And for me, the most exciting part of it is is asking, what can we do to change this? And that's where I started doing some experiments where, you know, in the case of of give and take, I wanted to to randomly assign people to, to think about themselves as givers and say, okay, let's Let's meet somebody who benefits from your job, or let's have you write a journal about the ways that you contribute to others. And then, you know, we can do a really clean, randomized, controlled experiment to see whether that affects their productivity, which, of course, it does. So that's kind of where I started. And, and so how much bulk do you need for you to be able to sort of raise the flag and say, you know what, here's a conclusion that I can make because I've surveyed X number of people. What's your take on that? So a lot of it depends on, on how strong an effect is. And, you know, with a, with, with a weaker effect, you need a larger sample size to get statistical power. But I don't think one study is ever compelling by itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I always try to do in my work is, you know, to triangulate across multiple samples with different kinds of methods. And so, you know, some of my favorite projects that I've done have been, you know, I go into an organization and, you know, I gather data from a few hundred people and, you know, and try to predict their job performance. And then I design a couple of randomized controlled experiments that are, you know, more controlled in the lab where, you know, where I can more precisely see exactly what's driving the effect and, you know, and why. 
look, I think there's, I understand why the big data movement has become so popular. Sure. And of course, you know, our, our results get more reliable as our samples get bigger. But I had a, a mentor early on, Richard Hackman, uh, who was one of the, one of the great thinkers and, and researchers on, on what makes a team effective. And one of the things that, that Richard impressed upon me was that sometimes you have to create the phenomenon in order to study it. And so I've I've seen this now when when I'm doing some research with pro sports teams. We want to know how a team can become more than the sum of its parts. And the reality is there aren't that many San Antonio Spurs. There aren't that many New England Patriots. And so, you know, I I can't say, well, let me let me find 50,000 teams where we can study this dynamic. What I want to do is I want to study, you know, the the small samples and then try to find as many of those small samples as I can to figure out, okay, what what can we learn that's robust? Sure. And and you were a competitive diver and and you know I love talking about sports, of course, and you just brought it up, which is awesome. What what can we learn about work from looking at sports teams and organizations, right? From the Spurs and from the Patriots. What what can we learn from there in the workplace that helps us show up at work and do what we do even better? How many hours do you have? I know. I would imagine. Exactly. What are your tops? It's, it's funny. I think I didn't realize this growing up. You know, I was a huge sports fan. You know, at first, I think my first dream was to be a baseball player. And then I found it was actually more fun to play basketball. And so I wanted to be a basketball <laughs> player. Mm-hmm. You know, you start, you start high school at four foot nine, and that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> Unless you're a really fast guard, man. Oh, I, you know, all I could do is shoot free throws, actually. That's okay. my only skill. All but right. what was kind of interesting was, uh, around middle school when I kept getting cut from the basketball team and you know hadn't yet realized I wasn't going to make high school soccer either. I uh, got together with a bunch of friends and we, we started doing what was, I guess, very early stage, like fantasy drafts where we would pick players and we would track their points. And, and then I entered a, uh, a Sports Illustrated for Kids contest to try to predict who would um, be in the Baseball World Series before the season began. And I was, even at that age, really interested in the, the, the traits of the players, not just their physical skills, but their character. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that that we can learn from from sports that I don't think we do well in the world of work that you know that I saw even as a twelve year old is how important practice is. I am stunned and I find it terrifying that you know that most surgeons don't practice all that much in hospitals, right? Their their practice is actually a performance with a real patient's life on the line. Wow. You know, as a as a speaker, I was originally taught to just get on stage. And, you know, it wasn't until several years of, of, you know, doing a lot of public speaking where I sat down with a coach who said, you know, if you want to get better at this, you, you really ought to practice. <laughs> and <laughs> it was a light bulb moment, you know, because I thought of, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to give 30 or 40 speeches in a year, uh, each one is kind of practice for the next one. And, you know, there, there are things that you just won't try on stage uh, that you'd experiment with in practice that are, are absolutely worth trying, Right. So that to me is, is a huge takeaway. Uh, and I could probably rattle, rattle off a list of, of 20 or 30 more, but what you live in both worlds, right? You, you represent athletes. Uh, you also have a job. You know, you do a lot of speaking. Uh, you've run teams uh, as an entrepreneur. What lessons have you applied from the sports world that are useful in your business career? Well, there's so many, like you said. I mean, that's what I find so intriguing about sports is it's such a metaphor for life. And, you know, that was my favorite part about being an agent, really, Adam, was that you you really, as much as I was negotiating their contracts and managing their careers, I was also a, a bit of a sponge because you have a chance to be beside people that have to wake up every day and execute on a world stage. And so for almost 20 years, you you watch the way they prepare, to your point about practice. You watch the way they recover from adversity. Um, the way they deal with change, the way they deal with fear and lean into it, even when they feel the fear that all of us in the workplace feel, but they step into it because over time and over lots of moments like that, they've seen that the other side of that is often a little bit better version of the person that stepped on that mound before Game 7 of the World Series. So like you, the list of lessons and and the metaphor is gigantic. So to be able to take those lessons and, and apply it to business people, to me, is incredibly powerful. But I love what you said. So how do business people practice? And, and how do you teach people to embrace that opportunity to practice? So I think one of the first things to do is there's a, an article that, that I assign to all my students every year uh, that Nancy Katz wrote uh, back in 2001. And it was about the lessons that work teams can learn from sports teams. And one of her points was that, you know, if, if you want to get better at practicing and make that sort of part of your routine, 
you need to take a page out of every team's playbook and review the game tape. You know, when you see how you did in yesterday's game and all the mistakes you made, uh, that's immediate motivation to say, okay, I want to go and practice. And it also gives you some, you know, some direct changes to work on, whether, you know, you're, you're just working individually or whether you are part of a team. And I think the problem is in most workplaces, we don't have access to game tape. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there aren't very many that, that go to the extreme that, that the hedge fund Bridgewater does and, right. and actually record meetings almost all the time. And so, you know, I think that what we need to do is we need to find good proxies for game tape. So as somebody who does a lot of writing, I've used, started using Google Docs more and more for my collaborative writing. And one of the things that, uh, that I've found really helpful when I actually managed to do it is to go back and review the history of a Google Doc, where you can see all the changes that people made at, you know, in different rounds. And you can actually look at, okay, what were our effective patterns of collaboration and where did we make mistakes? One of the things I noticed from doing that is I often jump in too early. So Molly, you probably know I'm I'm kind of a, the opposite of a procrastinator. I'm a precrastinator. <laughs> I know I've heard you talk about this. It's great. Yeah. So I um you know I just I love to dive right into something and and get it done early. And so sometimes uh, somebody will give feedback on you know on a draft of an article or a podcast episode or you know an editor will weigh in on on a section of a book, and I'll immediately want to fix it as opposed to waiting for a couple other pairs of eyes to look at it and you know, sort of weigh in with with their both diagnosis of the problems and also proposed solutions. And I've noticed that, that sometimes when I wait, I get access to more ideas and better ideas. And so uh, for me, that that's a simple way of reviewing the game tape. And then, you know, my practice is to say, okay, I've got to, what I've got to do is actually rehearse uh, drafting what I think is a good response or solution without actually hitting submit. Mm-hmm. Give yourself a minute for sure. I always try to tell sales teams that call on and sort of make pitches as a team is when you walk out of a out of a pitch, for example, or a meeting, to look at the person beside you that you in, embarked on that meeting with and sort of say, gosh, when they said this, should I have maybe done this? Or did I miss that? Or was that the right question in that moment? You know, to your point about rewinding that tape and looking back to get that live, fresh feedback, almost a bit of an action after review, right when you walk out from the person that was there with you. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny because one of the places where I've, I've seen people grow the most from, from doing that kind of review and reflection as an input into practice is, is definitely in, in teaching negotiations. Uh, and I know this is one of your core areas of expertise, sure. and it's been a huge part of, of your professional life. It wasn't until probably four or five years into teaching negotiations that I finally realized, you know, when, when students are doing all these, these mock exercises that we put together and then, you know, coming back together to, to find out how they did relative to other people who had the, the same roles, we should videotape them and let them watch themselves negotiate. And I will never forget before I had the, the thought <laughs> to do this, the first negotiation class I ever taught, uh, I had a student who came in and he completely screwed over the, the counterpart he was negotiating with. Okay. Um, he lied, which was one of the, the rules. You're not allowed to lie in, sure. in class negotiations. He, <laughs> he crossed the line. Uh, flat out lied. And, you know, then we get back into class and we debrief the the role play and it comes out that he's lied and nobody can believe it because everybody else followed the rules. And so at the end of the semester, I do uh, a bunch of awards for the negotiators and, you know, they vote on who's the most cooperative negotiator, who was the best actor, who was the most creative. And then there was who was most ruthless. And this particular guy was not only voted most ruthless in his class, <laughs> but also in another section of the class that I was teaching, <laughs> even though none of those people ever negotiated with him. He was so awful that his reputation wow, spread. Sure. And, you know, he was just seen as, as a huge taker. And I uh, ended up getting a call from him about a month after the class ended saying, you know, I was reflecting on my ruthless negotiator award. And, um, you know, I don't know if, if you or anybody in the class realized this, but I actually am planning to pursue a career as a, a sports executive. And this was me kind of practicing and trying to bring out the worst in other people so I could learn how to deal with it. And, you know, once I was known as a shark, I, I had to deal with all that. Interesting. So interesting. He is now the GM of a professional sports team in one of the four major sports. And he told me his biggest lesson from, from that experience was that he never leaves a deal without making sure the other side gets 51% because you're, he doesn't want to have that reputation as the person you can't trust. Wow. That's fantastic, though. What, a, what an interesting lesson to take you know, from, from sports and apply it to the business of sports. 
I've had some agents push back and say, you know, that's, that's too much. You know, if you do that, you're not representing your client well or your team well. Where do you come down on that? Well, I think, you know, so it's interesting that you bring this up because I think in negotiation, it's so important to add value to the people that you negotiate with. And it's so counterintuitive. And, you know, you wrote the book Give and Take. And I am such a big fan of that book and that work because I think that when you think about negotiation and you think about sports and certainly my role as an agent, when you add value to other people's lives, they want to help you, right? And so in a negotiation as an agent, I always found, although it be counterintuitive, I always found it so helpful to truly add value, almost as if when you sell, you add value to the people that you sell to. But when you add value to the people that you negotiate with, they like you and they maybe respect you and they appreciate you. And when they do that, they want to do a better deal with you. To me, negotiation is all about relationships for sure and your ability to truly connect. To answer your question, though, I think you can make somebody feel like they won. I had a guy that I negotiated with with (laughs) Nike all the time. And, you know, we would sort of go back and forth and we would meet and, and he was in Nike golf and he was a great guy. But at the end of every negotiation, he would always say to me, man, Molly, you got me again. You just got me again, girl. You just crushed me again. And the truth was I didn't, but he always made me feel that way. And so I think it's sort of an interesting thing, right? Like, do you actually settle at 51 or do you make them feel like that's where it's settled? And I think there's a difference. I like that a lot. So you you don't actually have to lose the negotiation. You just want to make sure that the other person feels like they, even if they, you know, if there wasn't a clear winner or loser, like they, they got something of value and it was a successful outcome. For sure. So, you know, give and take, I I, I love all of your books. Um, I've read them all. Oh, thank you. You might be a giver, Molly. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No taker ever likes that book. Oh, well I do. I just love it. And, and, you know, and I, connected to it because I do believe that in negotiation, we need to give to get. And so how do you see that book and the research that you did around that play into negotiation specifically? And what have you seen work based on your, your studies and your work in that space? Yeah. So it's interesting because I've, I've had a chance to look at this from personal experience and then, you know, as a social scientist and I'll tell you, I started my career as probably the worst negotiator in the history of my company. My first real job was uh, was negotiating advertising contracts uh, for the Let's Go Travel Guides when I was in college. And you know, I remember my boss giving me a, a list of of clients and saying, "Okay, you know, these people spent about three hundred grand last year uh, advertising, you know, their hotels and our books and their services. Uh, just call them up and get them to renew, and we have a ninety five percent renewal rate, so it shouldn't be that hard." And after my first week. I had zero renewals and I had three clients demanding a refund from the previous year. And so I became what I believe is the first person in the history of our company to ever give money back uh, that was already on the books from our previous year's (laughs) revenue. Uh, And so I I created a net loss. And I remember calling my mom and and saying, okay, you know, this is a disaster. And, And she said, well, I didn't raise a son to be a quitter. You work at that job until they fire you. Uh-huh. A good mom. <laughs> That's a good Michigan mom right there. Right there. Yes. I don't know the, the message I wanted to hear at the time, but it was definitely what I needed to hear. Sure. And I went and started studying persuasion and negotiation. And, you know, I, I learned that what I was doing was I was, you know, I was trying to be a giver to my clients, but I was doing that at the expense of my own company. And so I needed to figure out exactly to your point, how to help them feel like they were, they were getting what they needed and wanted. Uh, without sacrificing or jeopardizing, you know, my own goals as you know, as a representative of, of Let's Go, and so w- what I learned to do is, you know, is is say, look, you know, I, I want them to succeed, but I also need to be ambitious for for our success too, and you know, a lot of that for me was, you know, was about trying to find creative ways uh, to you know to help them that didn't cost us anything. Sure. Uh, so you know, in, in in one case, I remember reaching out to a, a prospect, you know, who just kept asking for more and more discounts to the point where we wouldn't be able to make any money on our ads. And finally, I said, you know what? Look, we actually can't price our, our ads this low. Uh, and we also have a real problem with setting precedent then with other advertisers. And you know, we're trying to be fair. But what I can do is, you know, is try to find out what your goals are and, and figure out if there are other ways to help you. And uh, I ended up introducing him to one of our other clients 
And they, they created a whole partnership that, that ended up making a bunch of money for both companies. That's outstanding. That is very much what I've, you know, what I've seen in the negotiation research uh, that I've read since then. There's a, a great meta-analysis that, that Karsten DeDrew led. It's a study of studies showing that the, the most effective negotiators uh, are high in concern for others, but they're also high in concern for self. And they say, look, you know, I, w- I want you to succeed at the other end of the table, Molly, but I also want to succeed too. And, and that makes it a lot easier to, you know, to do integrative negotiation, to expand the pie, to, to help both, both sides end up better off. And so it's about being creative about the way that you give. I think sometimes when people think about giving and negotiation, they think that they're giving things specific to the deal and they're making the deal worse. But the way that you gave was a way that everybody won. Yeah, I mean, I think you know every every negotiation is easier if you expand the time horizon. <laughs> you say, okay, let's even if this feels like a transaction, what if it were a multi year relationship? Mm-hmm. What are the kinds of things we would do for each other over that you know that period of time? And then also, if you expand the number of of issues or resources on the table, right? It's really hard. Uh, this is why it's it's so hard to negotiate with car dealers. Right? There's only one issue on the table, which is I want to pay as little as possible, <laughs> and they want me to pay as much as possible. Right. And so, you know, if you can if you can expand the number of, of issues and interests on the table, it's a lot easier to resolve. And, you know, I think the, the, there's a study that I love, which you will know from Give and Take, that uh, I think Bruce Berry led, where he actually measured MBA students' uh, cognitive abilities uh, going into a negotiation. So he basically had them take, uh, you know, take a test that would give an IQ score. You could do that with, uh, with a standard IQ test or with a GMAT. And then he measured the results they got in negotiation simulations. And it turned out that the smarter you are, the more the person at the other side of the table succeeded. Interesting. And that was your, your creativity point that the intelligent negotiator said, you know what, there have got to be some things that I can, you know, I can offer to this other person that will help them without hurting me. In just a minute, we'll get back to the episode. But first... Here's a free resource I want to share with you. How many of you are leaving money on the table because of costly negotiation mistakes? Getting the best possible outcome in a negotiation can be a challenge. Most people leave money on the table because they don't know how to navigate the conversation. We get it, and we're here to help. Go to 5negotiationmistakes.com to download our free PDF, 5 Negotiation Mistakes Costing You Money. In this free resource, you will learn how to avoid common mistakes. You discover things like how to identify and adapt to different style negotiators, how to maximize your deal points, how to ask with confidence. Once you read this PDF, you'll no longer feel frustrated and overwhelmed when it's time to negotiate. So here's all you need to do next. Download five negotiation mistakes costing you money. Check it out, read it, review it, and start negotiating like a pro. All you have to do is go to 5negotiationmistakes.com for the free download. That's five, like the number five, negotiationmistakes.com. Now back to the conversation. Tell me this, when you think about givers and takers and your work, how do givers make sure they don't burn out? Well, I think that the, I mean, the heart of that question is is really about saying, how do I set boundaries? Mm Mm-hmm. I think the mistake that you know that that givers who do burnout make is they they become too selfless and they they you know they do a version of what I was describing in my in my own advertising sales role of saying all right my only goal is to be helpful to other people and you know I'm always on the back burner and I don't pay any attention to my own needs or interests and what you see with with givers who you know are are not exhausted but energized is they're just more thoughtful about the helping decisions they make. And you can break that down into three kinds of choices. There's the question of who you help, when you help, and how you help. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So burned out givers uh, say yes to everyone. Uh, energized givers say, you know what? I am going to try to help people who will pay it back or pay it forward. So you know, if I know somebody to be a matcher or a giver, I'll be very generous with them. But if somebody has a history or reputation of selfish behavior, I'm going to protect myself and not overextend. And you know, that's where in negotiations, for example, uh, it's actually helpful if you know someone is a taker to go more into matcher mode and say, all right, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to offer something to you unless you reciprocate. Right, right. And then the when and how questions you know, really just boil down to failed givers dropping everything whenever someone else needs something and, and successful givers saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to block out time to be productive and, and work toward my own goals. 
and I will dedicate separate windows to be available to other people. And I'll, you know, I'll try to make sure that I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to treat both of those like a balancing act. Uh, I'm actually going to say, look, you know, I, I have times where I'm completely unresponsive to other people unless it's an emergency because I have some important priorities I need to advance. And there are other times when, you know, when I'm totally available to other people and my own work, you know, kind of moves. So I guess it's it's more juggling than balancing in that sense. And I think um, that the how is the most interesting part to me. What you see with burned out givers is they start to become helpful and then they get a reputation for being generous and no good deed goes unpunished. Mm. And, you know, they, they just get drawn into helping in all these different ways that are actually not in their skill set. <laughs> and what you see with, with energized givers is they say, look, I've got, you know, two or three ways of helping that I enjoy and that I, I excel at and I'm going to focus on those. And so for me, for example, you know, I, I found that I had a lot of students coming in for career advice in my office hours uh, when I started teaching. And I'm like, I'm the worst person to come to for career advice because like, I chose a job where I study other people's jobs in part because I didn't know what job I wanted to do. <laughs> That's great. Uh, what would happen is you know, I'd give some suggestions to my own students because I felt like I got to know them, but then they would send some of their friends into office hours who weren't even in my class. And I didn't know anything about them. And then when I became an author, I started hearing from total strangers, you know, can you help me figure out my career? I'm like, I'm not good at that. And <laughs> even if I were, I don't know you. So I'm definitely not going to be good at that. And so you know, I used to try to say yes to those people and help them. And what I've learned to do now is instead say, okay, uh, this is not my, you know, my, my core contribution. And here are a couple of books I've read that I think I would be, might be helpful on that. But, you know, if, if I can share a piece of evidence on work in psychology, you know, with you, that's, you know, that's kind of, that's what I do. Uh, and also I'm, I'm happy to figure out if I can connect you to somebody else, you know, who might be helpful if, if it's not going to be a huge imposition on them. And so I've tried to zoom in on sharing certain kinds of knowledge and making kind of mutually beneficial introductions is the two ways of helping that I enjoy and excel at and uh, trying to do less of the rest. Sure. Tell me this, you know, option B, I want to shift to option B and, and uh, another book that you obviously wrote with Sheryl Sandberg after the death of her husband, Dave. And, and obviously that's such a personal topic to write about. Tell me this, how did writing that book and working with her on that book changed the way you viewed resiliency? I think, you know, it's interesting. I think resilience is is bouncing back from adversity and in some cases even bouncing forward. And I think that before the tragedy of losing Dave, uh, before, you know, everything Cheryl and I learned uh, researching and, and writing option B, I think one of my my biggest assumptions was that you know, resilience is all about strength and it comes from having a sense of meaning. And, you know, we have, we have a wealth of evidence that this is true, right? That the, the people who, you know, who are able to pick themselves up after a major setback or even a minor one are the ones who have a strong sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, I, I came to see other kinds of, of positive emotions as frivolous, like joy. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, joy is fun, but who needs it? Right? Right. Like what we need is... Yeah. What we need is, you know, a, a real sense of mission and, you know, a sense that our work and our lives matter, that we're important. And that's what gives us strength. And one of the things I learned from Cheryl's experience, uh, which, you know, kind of opened my eyes to a bunch of research I had not paid enough attention to, is that joy is not frivolous. That, you know, that that actually having those those moments where you feel like you just get a skip in your step, where you have something to look forward to those actually add up to give us strength. Mm -hmm. And they give us, you know, some reason to go and find meaning again. Uh, or, you know, if you feel like meaning is lost, uh, you can still look forward to the small pleasure of, you know, of a, of a moment that you've planned. And I think I, I really underestimated the importance of moments of joy for actually building resilience. Mm -hmm. And meaning and purpose and mission. I love all of those, those words I think are so important in all of our lives no matter what phase of life we're in, certainly, right? I think so too. And, you know, I think people are often given advice to, to keep gratitude journals. I know. I love this, this thought. I know where you're going. This is good stuff. Yeah. So, well, you, you be the judge. But the evidence has, has shown that, yes, it's helpful to keep a gratitude journal, especially if, if you do it once a week uh, as opposed to daily, where you can find meaningful things to be grateful for every few days. I don't think that's enough. I actually think we need to also keep track of our moments of joy. And one of the, the suggestions I gave to Cheryl was based on some research showing that 
if you journal about moments of joy, it, it doesn't just help you notice them, it actually increases them. And, you know, at first I was like, why, why would this be? And if you look at the data, it seems that a few things happen. The first one is when you, when you capture moments of joy, you actually start to pay more attention to them. And so Cheryl would say, this will make the notebook, <laughs> uh, you know, in that moment. And it kind of brightened the moment, right? It, it helped her savor it, uh, which is great. A second thing is, uh, you know, it helps you recalibrate when, you know, when you're really down. It's easy to assume that there's no joy in your life. But if you take a moment to jot down at least a few things that have sparked a tiny bit of, you know, of, of excitement or enthusiasm or happiness or contentment, then, you know, it, it kind of changes your, your frame a little bit. And then maybe the most important part is you actually learn from your own patterns, mm. right? So one of the things Cheryl noticed when, uh, when she was, was journaling was she found a lot of joy in, in listening to music. And she didn't really make space for music in her life. And so she had, you know, she had played the piano when she was younger and she just, she picked up a routine knowing that music brought her so much joy of, you know, of just of playing again, even just taking a minute to do that, you know, when, when she was grieving over losing her husband, you know, was, was something that brought just a, a little bit of, you know, of, of solace. And so I think there's real value in journaling about joy. And uh, I guess I should take my own advice. Do you do that, Molly? <laughs> well, you call it count your contributions. And I love how you phrase that. I, I don't do that. I probably do that in my head a lot. And I have, my husband and I have three daughters and I always try to talk about gratitude a lot. But I'm going to introduce this to our family because I think this is a really powerful way to think about it. And I love your point that the more we think about it, which makes sense, of course, the more it becomes a reality. So thank you for that. It's worth about as much as you paid for it. <laughs> 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 so, you know, a couple just sort of miscellaneous questions I'm curious about. You know, you've been inside of so many organizations from Google to, to the Eagles, right? You know, to N the NBA teams, to various teams, to, to Amazon. What, what is the most meaningful work that you do, Adam, and, and why? Oh, uh, that, that's easy. Uh, teaching, for sure. Okay. I think there, there are a couple of reasons. One is that when, uh, when I'm in the classroom, I think there's there's a chance to build a relationship with students and really understand, you know, what what problems they're trying to solve, what big questions they're grappling with about their careers, and I, I think it's always it's it's easier to have a lasting impact when you really know the people that you're you're trying to work with and teach. And then I think the other thing is uh, they're they're kind of at a often I guess a critical and open phase of their lives. I remember being an undergrad and just having no idea what I wanted to do. And you know, being being ready and willing to soak up whatever ideas I could find anywhere. And you know, I don't I don't think we're that open at every moment uh, when we're not in those kinds of transitions. And so, you know, I feel like in some ways like, they don't listen to their parents anymore, but they don't necessarily trust their own compass entirely either. <laughs> so uh, I think it's you know it's a time where uh, where there, there are lots of ways to to share knowledge or ideas that may be helpful and. You know, I think, uh, look, I love working with organizations. Uh, I'm really passionate about speaking and writing, but the, the impact is just less visible and less certain, right? Like, I don't know when I write a book who's going to read it or how they're going to be affected, whereas I, I get to see vividly where, when I'm successful, uh, my, you know, my class or my advice makes a difference for my students. Mm, that's so neat. Right. That gives you meaning. You're moving the needle in their lives in such an integral point, at such an integral point in their lives, for sure. And hopefully I don't ruin their lives. I'm sure you <laughs> add a ton of value. I know that there's a line of kids following you to your office for office hours <laughs> constantly. You know, you note that we spend about a quarter of our lives at work. So I'm curious with you, what's your approach when it comes to, to work and life? Is it integration? Is it balance? Is it something else? I, I guess I think about it more in terms of rhythm. Mm-hmm. I think that what we probably need is, you know, I guess it goes to something I was saying earlier that, you know, I, I, I don't think it's possible for anyone who's highly motivated to be in perfect balance all the time. Sure. Uh, I think that's a myth, right? I, I don't know anyone who says, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend the optimal number of hours of <laughs> work and family and sleep and exercise and friends each day. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess I've started to think about the work-life question as uh, as kind of a song, where you know I pick up different beats and tempos and melodies throughout the course of a week or a month, and so what I try to do is have 
a few days a week that are more tilted in one direction. Uh, so I might have the beginning of the week uh, really kind of heavy on work time. And then the rest of the week is prioritizing family first. And, you know, I, I know that I'm kind of lopsided and out of balance on an, on an individual day, but that by the time the week is finished, I feel like I've, I've spent a lot of quality time with my family and I've also made real progress on my work goals. And so that, that for me is, is kind of a rhythm. That's a neat way to say it because I think I agree with you. I mean, I think we can't have perfect balance every day. It's about how do we look back at a week or a month and say, how did I do? You know what I mean? How did I feel? Who did I contribute to? How did I get better? How did I get the people around me better? But I think if we look at it in isolation, it's difficult to measure because to your point, super motivated people probably are out of balance at certain points in their lives. That's maybe how they got there, right? Yeah, I think we have to be. Yeah, for sure. Tell me this, what, what are some resources you'd recommend for our listeners? What are some of the things that you lean on that are things that, that contribute to your life, that can maybe contribute to your joy that, that our listeners could grab onto and, and deploy in their own lives? One of my favorite resources is called Nuzzle. All right. Uh, N-U-Z-Z-E-L. Okay. Uh, it's, it's one of the easiest ways to not get sucked into hours of social media. Or, you know, even just wasting nine hours reading the news when you have other things to be doing. Mm -hmm. How does it work? Uh, it's, it's basically an aggregator of what the people that you follow on Twitter are sharing. And so I get a, you can, you can set your digest however you want. What, what happens for me is I get an email at 8 p.m. every day, which shows me the most popular articles shared by the people that I've chosen to follow. And so it's kind of like a curated set of insights and ideas and articles that, uh, that are right up my alley. And I don't spend much time throughout the day then going through, okay, like what's going on in the world or how do I keep up with everyone's feet? You just get that at the end of the day and boom, that's how you consume your content sort of toward the end of the day. Yeah. And I know that if, you know, if something really interesting was written, a bunch of people will have shared. It. That's awesome. So, that's awesome. Are. So it's worth reading. Okay, Adam, you've been so generous with your time. We end with rapid fire. So I'm going to just fire off some questions to you and you just fire back. All right? Fire away. All right. What's your favorite book that you've ever read? Oh, so hard. <laughs> I'm going to say Ender's Game. Ender's Game. A book you would recommend for leaders? Oh, I wish leaders would read more social science. Um, mm. Good place to start would be... Leading Teams by Hackman. Okay. What's your favorite app? Probably LinkedIn because it's what helps me figure out uh, who I know in a given workplace when my students are trying to figure out how to get a job somewhere where nobody recruits. Mm -hmm. What's your most favorite part of your job? Uh, my favorite part of my job is uh, the fact that I get to design it. Mm person you would most like to meet? Oh, that's easy. J.K. Rowling. Oh, right. Okay. An organization you would love to study? Organization I would love to study. I feel like I've been really lucky to study some of the ones that I've found most interesting. Uh, as uh, That's kind of part of the reason I started my work-life podcast with Ted was, uh, was to have an excuse to go into really interesting places. Uh, Which, I by the way, we'll Adam, I love it. Your podcast oh, is amazing. You. And for listeners... For Work Life is Adam's podcast with Ted. It's incredible. That's, uh, that's exceedingly generous of you. Thank you. You know, I'll tell you, I would, uh, one thing I would like to do would be, I'd love to go into the, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights and figure out how in the world they did it. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what intrigues you most about that? I just, I think it's, when you're starting a sports franchise, uh -huh. it's, it's kind of impossible to be any good. Sure. Right, because you, you kind of get the leftovers right. from a lot of other organizations. <laughs> sure. Uh, and even, even if you get some decent players, nobody gives up their stars for you. Right? And right. so, you know, I think that I'm always interested in people who, who overachieve or, you know, in some ways uh, seem to raise the bar on what their mm -hmm. potential is. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be interested in, you know, what are, what are the practices they use for developing players? Mm -hmm. uh, how do they think about team chemistry? And what can we learn from them about spotting talent maybe in unlikely places or bringing out the best in people? That's neat. That's neat. The show's called Game Changer. So one last question. What Game Changer inspires you and why? Does it have to be a person? No, not necessarily. 
probably the the game changer that inspires me most consistently. Well, actually, it's uh, it's a podcast, Invisibilia. Invisibilia. Yeah, it's an NPR podcast, and what I think is game changing about it is, I feel like I know the hosts, even though I've never met them. I think I had a like a quick Twitter message exchange with one of them once before I even ever listened to the show, and it's really taken me inside the worlds of of people that I've never really thought about or had access to before, and. It's kind of both changed and expanded my vision of what's possible to do in talking to a listener. So you take the things that you listen and you hear and try to deploy it when you're doing work life. Oh, yeah. One of the, I mean, probably my favorite, my favorite podcast episode ever uh, is Invisibilia's episode on how to become Batman. Okay. (laughs) And it's about a guy who, who's blind and he can not only cross the street in a busy intersection, He's also taught five-year-olds to do it. And the way they do it is uh, it's eco-location. So he clicks like, uh-huh. and then he hears, he hears the, I guess, the vibrations back and it activates the visual cortex. And it was just, it was remarkable Wow! Uh, because you can't see what he's seeing. You can only hear what he's hearing. And so it was an invitation into the world of somebody learning to see without having uh, working eyes. And I was just blown away by, you know, by, of course, the the characters in it, but also the way the story was told and the sound was brought to life. And I found that game changing. Wow, that's a good one. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to check out Nuzzle. I'm on this Invisibilia. I mean, now, man, I'm busy. I mean, you're, you're loading me <laughs> up, that, man. Molly. No, I love it. I love it. My bad. Adam, thank you for coming on. Um, Thank you for the books that you write, for the kids that you influence each and every day, for the speeches that you give, for the companies that you change. You're a remarkable guy. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for for engaging and for for sharing these ideas, but more importantly, for, for practicing many of the things that I study. It's always a treat to connect with somebody who is so passionate about sharing knowledge and getting good ideas and evidence out there. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. And you're not going to want to miss the next episode. I've got a real game changer. Soccer superstar Carly Lloyd is on the show. The Team USA star joins me to talk about her unlikely journey to the top of the soccer world and how she developed her trademark work ethic, competitive fire, and mental toughness. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There, you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.